Hello and welcome to The Reassembler with me, James May. It's a show where we put things back together again. That's it. That's not a familiar bit. It is only when these objects are laid out in hundreds of bits and then slowly reassembled dun, 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 dun. that you can truly understand and appreciate how they work yeah. and just how ingenious they are. Deep joy. And if painstakingly putting hundreds of pieces back together again Oh, God, it's electrics. wasn't hard enough Fantastic, we've used all the bits. I then have to find out Oh, yes! if they'll work. No, it's all come apart. Back in 1957, this was as smart as a telephone could be, and it could do just two things. You could dial a number with it, or if somebody dialed you, it would ring. Nevertheless, this was a high watermark in the development of the telephone because it was the first GPO British Bakelite domestic telephone with a bell enclosed in the case. This phone has 211 separate tiny parts, every single one designed with an engineering eye for detail that is staggering. We've sent people to the moon in equipment that has been less well engineered. Actually, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but this is nanotechnology 1950s style. However, in this form, it resembles the most mind-bending Meccano set on the planet. First, we shall assemble the receiver. The bits are going to go in this plastic pot because they're all very small and very easily lost. Come and just have a quick look at these. These are tiny, tiny bits that I'm going to have to put together. Look at the size of that bit. See? Now, I've got to be honest. I'm slightly out of my comfort zone because I've never done something like a telephone before and I don't have an exploded diagram. All I have is a circuit diagram. That's it. The rest of it is all down to instinct, luck, who knows. That, that's the speaky into bit, so that must go on that end. Obviously, once you've put the innards in. The receiver is also a transmitter. It uses electromagnetism to convert sound waves into a signal that can be transmitted to the person we're talking to, and vice versa. I want to show you an amazing tool I've been lent. Look at this. It's a screwdriver with a sleeve on it, and when you slide the sleeve along, the end of the screwdriver becomes slightly smaller, but it's not quite that simple, because if you look lengthways down it, there are two separate overlapping blades. And what this means is, the trouble with trying to do with little screws is they fall off the end of the screwdriver and your fingers are too big to hold onto them, so that will just drop off. But if you put it on there and slide that along, the two blades slide together, become very, very slightly thicker, and then hold the screw on. Look at that. That is the most brilliant screwdriver I've ever seen in my life. We'll come up with a way of nicking it later. So having tightened that, if I retract the sleeve, the screwdriver comes out. That is absolutely fabulous. So one of those contacts in the bottom is linked somehow to the top. And those screws are the right length to hold that in place, I would say. I'm going to make an executive decision on that and put those in using the vintage, rather lovely actually, uh, GPO screwdriver. Where does that go? That fits there, and I would imagine this is designed to some extent to stop the wires being pulled off if somebody tugs on the receiver. It's a little bit like a sort of cable clamp. Also, the two holes in the plate line up with the two holes in the Bakelite inside the receiver. Yes, 
Yes. Right, interesting. I'm finding it quite interesting. Well, that positions there quite nicely. Screws in thus. Now for some wires. The different colours in the receiver from the ones that are in the chassis of the thing, which we're going to come on to later. Now, I've worked out from the wiring diagram, red, green and white are the three colours going to what would appear to be the receiver. Red, green and white are what I have on ye olde, um, what do you call this bit on a telephone? The, what do you call this bit? Cord. The cord, yes, thank you. Now, that must go through that special magic screwdriver into there. That isn't quite in the clamp. Ah, that goes over, ah, yes, yes. That's brilliant, look, there's a, that's a loop in the cord. Can you just see it starting to poke its little head up there? And that hooks over that little bit on the plate so that if somebody dropped the receiver or tugged on it, it wouldn't pull the wires out of the connectors or pull the joints apart. It would simply pull on that. Um, and I just have to find a means. Neldy nose pliers. Like so. Tug on that to your heart's content. Right, the diaphragm piece slides gently sideways. The diaphragm is a is, um, very simplified version of the um, cone in the speaker of your home hi-fi. It simply vibrates and moves a greater volume of air, so it makes more sound. Sound being just the air moving backwards and forwards. That should screw on there. Just before I put it in, this bit, which is the bit you speak into, the microphone, if you like, if you shake it, you can hear, I'll shake it right next to the microphone. Can you hear that little noise? Can you hear that sound department? That is that is the sound of carbon granules inside there. It's a way of making your voice clearer because your voice vibrates the diaphragm behind there. That compresses and rarefies the mass of carbon crystals. That changes their resistance, which then gives you a clearer, better defined signal traveling down the wire to the person at the other end, and it will go in his or her ear there. Now that rests on a pin there. It's not hardwired in, it sits on a pin which makes contact, but that's so that you can easily take it out and replace it, because these would wear out, the carbon would become all clumped together, especially in houses in the 1950s, because they'd have been horribly damp. Now that's got to go to there, so... Clonk, clonk. Hello, caller. There you go. We are 44 minutes into our attempt to reassemble our 1957 Bakelite telephone with an internal cased bell, and we've a completed receiver. The intricacies of the receiver, however, are nothing compared with the next familiar part we have to rebuild, the dial. Now returning to the fantastic sweet shop of telephone componentry with my special little pot. And I'm going to take the components for the dial plate. That, that, that brass backing piece and two tiny, tiny little screws. That's not a great deal of stuff, but I think it's going to be quite fiddly to put together. So let's not be over ambitious. The reason I wanted to make a bit of a thing about the dial plate to be honest, is because those of us over a certain age, I hate having to admit to this because it does make me sound very old, but we do remember a time when most of us did spend our lives dialing by putting our fingers in holes, turning the dial and letting it go back to the beginning. 
So there you go. The, the holes, I, I remember this, actually. It's a long time since I've used a telephone with a dial on it. But when the telephone was invented, I mean, the dial goes back to, I think, the 19th century. I don't think the dimensions of it changed since then. But people who were undernourished back then didn't have such big fingers. The, the holes were always slightly too small. You could get through, say you had a reasonably big number with about eight or ten digits in it, you could get most of the way through it and then your finger would slip out and it would go bzzz back to the beginning. You'd think, oh, cock, you know, you'd have to put the receiver down and start again. You know, you had to make sure you'd been to the lavatory before you used the telephone because you could be caught short halfway through your number. It just took forever. I am starving, but once this is back together, I can ring up for a pizza. Oh, I didn't have pizza in those days, did they? I'd have rung up for some boiled beef and carrots. <laughs> so the, the actually part. building a time machine. <laughs> well, you sort of are, you say that. If we get this thing working, I'll probably be able to speak to my departed ancestors on it. It's one of the things I always used to find very creepy about telephones when I was a child, because I thought everything that had ever been said in them was still in them. So I couldn't understand how all those people fitted in the television either. <laughs> I was only about three. Let's go and collect some more components. I think we'll do the other side of the dial, which starts to get very tricky. But I'm going to continue my tireless work on the dial, um, which will involve this large plate onto which everything goes one way or another, I think. Um, these lovely little brass bits. Everything is very beautifully made in this, it must be said. A spring. I think that should do, that should do us for several hours, I should think. The first challenge is to build the mechanism that controls the dial. That's a cheese head screw, parallel sided. It's got like a, a wheel of cheese shape on the top. And that hole there is quite clearly made to accommodate that. So that's, that's a bit of a clue to start with. And that diameter quite clearly passes through that one. I must say that this thing I mean, is very much of its type. It's very, very old fashioned, but it is exquisitely made. These telephones must have cost a fortune. Although, of course, you didn't buy a telephone in the olden days. It always belonged to the government, effectively. You rented the telephone, you had line rental, and you had that included the telephone. The telephone, I remember in a flat I used to own, which I'd bought from some very old people, the telephone was hardwired into the wall. There was none of this pulling the plug out and moving it around. And in fact, technically, you weren't allowed to unwire it yourself. You had to call a man from the post office to come and do it. Not by the time I got there, because, you know, that was in the 90s, but they would have done. What the hell are you going on about, mate? Just shut up and put the telephone together. Right, so the spring... I do like a good spring. That's a lovely spring. This is working. It's quite pleasurable watching the spring diminish in size but increase in potential energy because it's being wound up. But it does mean that the risk at the same time is also increasing that I will lose concentration for a millionth of a second and the noise you will hear will be bang. That's all you will hear, and then there will be nothing there. This will be a quantum event. There will be a spring there, and then there won't be a spring there. There will be no discernible spring making its way from here to over there. It'll just be bang, and it, will, it won't, won't be there anymore. I've done it. That spring will go in there. It'll stay in there forever now, coiled in the darkness, waiting to respond to the eager fingers of young lovers and businessmen trying to close deal. I am just a spring, but I'm here to serve you by returning that dial to the beginning so you can put another number in. So if I hold that with my fingers and they line up, it's, it's extremely nicely made to very close tolerances, but it would have to be, wouldn't it? But I haven't got the nest on the other end, but you can already see that's, that's ready to return. It's exciting, isn't it? And now that, but I'm not sure how I know what position that should go in. Maybe it doesn't matter. Well, it can't matter, because otherwise 
I can tell by the way this thing is made. If it did matter, they would have made sure I got it in the right position. So that's what the Japanese would call pokeyoki, i.e. foolproofing, making sure something will only go together the right way. But it wasn't a completely new idea. There's a little bit of it in here. So there, I've got two nuts. I'm guessing one is a nut to get it nicely snuggled down, and the other one is a locking nut to go on the top. It's, it's really difficult when you... somewhere close to a dolly. It's not doing the digger, 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 digger bit yet because we don't have the mechanisms in place to make the little pulses. So look, that, I'm not actually even sure what this bit is called, but it, that rubbery bit obviously interacts in some way with those slots, I would say, because it's the right size to. That end will go into a hole to locate that end, and the screw goes through that end. So I'm looking for a threaded hole of that size, that distance, from there to there, from a hole that would obviously locate that. So, thus. So that is free to pivot. Watch the little rubber bit. As I dial, then as that comes back, that's something to do with the pulsing because it's got a slot for every number. Right, should we get some more bits? We are one hour and 32 minutes into the reassembly. And as well as the receiver and the face of the dial itself, half the mechanism that controls it has been built, including the spring that ensures the dial snaps back into position when being used. But now it's time to delve into the dark mechanical secrets that lurk behind the innocent dial of the antique telephone. Now this, I know because I've seen something like this before, this is a, it's, it's a governor. It's gonna slow down the dial as it goes back because that will spin very, very quickly. Those two weights will be thrown out and will rub on the inside of that little cylinder. And that will retard, I imagine, the return of the dial. We would take the governor and the governor, I don't know what you actually call that, I'm going to call it the governor pot, and offer that up to the bearing. Offer it up is one of those things you see in old instruction manuals and technical books. Offer it up means line it up with and get it roughly in the right position. But where's the camera gone? Oh yeah. Get it roughly in the right position, but, but we're not talking about anything permanent yet. It's, not, it's an offer. It is just an offer. It's not a contract. You offer it up, and then you sign the contract with the screws or whatever holds it permanently in place. So I will offer it up to the camera. Here's our little governor, whizzy round and round. That would eventually be engaged, engaged with the... I don't really want to call them the teeth. They're more like pallets on the bottom of that fibre arrangement. Now, having offered that up, I'm going to offer up the little screws and washers that hold that plate in place. Smashing. It is rather beautiful, it must be said. There's a little clutch inside that fibre wheel arrangement. That's fantastic, isn't it? Let's consider all the bits left over. Now, this is a fabulous moment. I can put this on, but how I hear you cry as one. I've got it, I've got it. That has to go there because the two screws that hold the finger stop in place also trap that. Does that sound believable?
so young people observe. In the olden days, our telephone number at home was... Uh, 01709373323. So let's dial that. O one seven O nine three seven three two three. That's one number. I mean, it's just agony. And often, sometimes, it'd be a bit like filling up the car with petrol. You'd think, I'll ring Cookie. I wonder if he wants to come out to the pub. I'll ring... Oh, I can't be bothered. You'd give up. See, the numbers got gradually bigger over the years because they had to add an extra number to the number for the house, then an extra number to the code, and then another extra number to the code, because nobody ever anticipated how many telephones there would be, and they're still getting it wrong with mobile phones. But then again, when the telephone was a new invention, Graham Bell said it was such a good idea that eventually every town would have one. I'm not a believer that the olden days were better than the modern world. I think it's complete nonsense. There are only two things I've ever identified that genuinely were better in the past, and those are electric kettles, because they just break after 15 minutes these days, and American pickup trucks, which were better looking in the 70s. But something else I may have to admit Something that was consistently of extremely high quality was small fixings. These things are just, they're absolutely gorgeous. They're just, they're beautifully made. <laughs> Two hours and 49 minutes in and I have reassembled the receiver and the dial. That's the mouth, ears and heart of the phone. But now we're going to look at the brains of the machine, that is the chassis. This is where all the electrical shenanigans goes on and where the telephone is made to live, if you like, where its soul dwells. If René Descartes had anything to do with telephones, he would have said this was its... this was its what's-it gland. Right. Now, it is time for a little bit of a confession, because all those bits that I've just collected, this is actually only half of the story. We have this going here, there's that to go inside some wires, this bit, this which goes up here and will eventually be screwed on, and capacitors and uh, little transformers and all the rest of it. But the honest truth is, there is also a huge amount of wiring that's all bundled up under there, lots and lots of minute soldering. It's reckoned by the telephone experts that I've talked to that the process of putting this together could take up to two days. So, for the first and only time in this series, possibly even in my life, I'm able to say, here's one we prepared earlier. And I'd just like to point out, I mean, I, I, mean, I believe I could do this, of course, but no one else is prepared to let me try. <laughs> There's a huge amount, look at that under there. This is what the world was like before we had microprocessors. Every single connection, every little on and off was a separate wire, a separate switch, an actual physical thing. That's what all that is. And this is just one telephone and all this telephone does is dial numbers. That's all it does. Let's get some more bits. Some of you will be saying, I wish they'd do the whole series like that. I know, but tough luck. This table of components is a bit like one of those bowls of pasta that you keep eating for about half an hour, but it doesn't actually get any smaller. You know the sort of thing I mean. We need those. I think I need that and those two little screws. Um, I need those two. I don't need those. I do need that and I need all of those except that. Still just as big as it was. I suppose the first bit of this is mildly exciting because it involves the setup of the bell, the voice of the telephone rather than the voice of the person on the telephone. This little block has a screw that goes in it, which I think is that one. Yes, it is. Just put that in loosely for the moment. M1. 
one of these passes through each of those holes, being very careful as you move these things around, not to knacker any of the soldered connections. If I get this the wrong way round, which I'm not planning on doing, but if I do, the actually the bell won't ring, so you won't know if anybody's ringing you up, which I suppose would defeat the whole point of having a telephone. That eventually is, that, I mean, that's the clapper. So eventually that will be made to vibrate like that and it will strike the two bells. The bells aren't going in yet, but that's, that unalloyed pleasure is yet to be yours, watching the bells go in. Now I think probably those two nuts aren't tight yet, neither is that screw, which is effectively a clamp for that bit, but I think first I will secure that whole assembly to the chassis with these two very nice shiny little chassis screws and then I'll give it a bit of a jiggle and make sure everything is good. Did that in the wrong order, should have put a screw on the end of my magic screwdriver first, but I think it may be possible to do it one-handed. It is. There, that's looking quite good. <clears throat> tight, tight. Ring, 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 ring. Right, should we do some more? Now we shall attach the dial cord, which is that bit, plus the dial cord fixing screws and so on, but never mind that. Most excitingly, we can fit the bells. Now, it's interesting that the two bells, I wonder if I can demonstrate this, are slightly different because that's what gives a British telephone its characteristic rather warm and unaggressive ring. Also, we have the, the, uh, the rhythm dring, 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 whereas the Americans, you'll know this from films, have dring, dring. The British ring is better, obviously. This is weird, I haven't, haven't heard those two tones for many, many years. But it does take me back. A bit like meeting a kid with mumps. And while you reminisce about mid-20th century childhood ailments, I have a dial cord to attach. Beautiful. Right, now, the modern line. This is the bridge between the world of the 1950s, when people said Whitehall 1212, and the modern world, when people go, hey, when they answer the telephone. This connects to the old tech here and to the modern world at that end. So this is sort of the cable of time travel. Well, that's slightly clumsy, but obviously this, this board wasn't originally designed to take that shape connector, but I think we'll get away with it. You won't be able to see it. But finally, Remember what we saw in the receiver many, many, many hours ago about how there was a nice little loop in the fabric of the cord in order to secure it and make sure that the connections couldn't be pulled apart. There's something very similar here. There's two free ends which you simply tie around these chassis posts. I'm silence. So that once again, any tugging on the telephone or tugging on the receiver isn't going to pull all the wires apart. Lift 
and under. There you go. With enough cord left that you'll be able to untie it next time somebody wants to take this to bits. Marvellous. What you're actually looking at there is a telephone. That is all the functioning stuff. It just doesn't look like a telephone yet because it's not in a telephone case. And let's not forget this was the first GPO British domestic provided Bakelite telephone with an internal bell. So let's internalise the bell. Out of habit, I've, I've uh, brought my little sweet box thing along, but actually, all I'm looking for is the two little, I don't even know what they're called, the little plungy plip, plip, plip things, and the, there you go. So these two pieces are the, the, the things that you tap down upon that they will be spring-loaded when they're in the whole assembly, and they stick out of there. So when you can't, you, you know, you go, operator, operator, and tap on those, that's what we're looking at. I'm not entirely sure how they go together, but let's... So that slides in there, so I'm guessing that would go through there, and then you would put the nut on from the other side, and then when they're under spring tension, they will pop up. I've got to admit to being slightly conflicted about this whole thing, because one part of me really likes putting things together and mending things. If I see a bicycle with a puncture or, you know, a badly crashed Hornby train or something like that, I have a desperate urge to save it. But another part of me thinks that all things from the past should just be thrown away because it's over. Even though I, I, I react to a thing like a telephone in bits the way I do when I see one of those appeals to save a sad donkey on one of those charity things. But on the other hand, you have to remember that this is, this is from the 50s and, I don't know, declarations of love would have been made down this thing by people who have since turned to dust. So it's a bit haunted. You'd imagine said, I know your wife's going to find out, but I love you. He's dead. So's she, so's the wife. None of it matters. The poet Larkin said that the only thing that would survive of us is love, but actually he was wrong. It's the Bakelite telephone who survived the nuclear winter. So I forgot my sweet pot. We're four hours and 41 minutes into the build and a phone is starting to emerge. There's a receiver, a dial complete with mechanism, electrics, bell and case. Marvellous. Yeah. Now, what I'll do next is put the dial on, and in fact, I need to go back to my table of pieces to get the five tiny little screws that hold that together. Right, it's those ones. Tiny, tiny little screws. They will attach the wires that run from, from the chassis up to the dial. Five of them. They're nice, they're nice little screws, I'll give them that. I'm going to have to look at the wiring diagram to remember the order in which those wires connect to the tiny little contacts on the back of the dial. And the order goes orange, pink, brown, slate, grey, blue. Orange, pink, brown, slate, grey, blue. That's exactly what we've got. Now, these are some of the smaller screws in the telephone, look. Tiny little screw. The screw is a remarkable thing, actually, isn't it? Should we think about screws for a minute? The thread form. That goes all the way back to Archimedes. But it's one of those things we haven't managed to shake off. We still depend on them. We don't use them in, in this sort of application anymore. If you look at a telephone from, say, the 1980s, the wires are attached with little jaws that automatically strip them and clamp them as you push them in, so you don't have to fiddle around with small screws anymore. And obviously, in, in something like a smartphone, then it's all plug-in modules. There are, no, there are no screws involved. So that is a massive component by modern standards, but it's a tiny one by the standards of the, of the age when this telephone was made. But think of all the things that screws do. They attach things together, they make things move in proportion. Shall I put them in? It's only now, after five hours, that the 211 separate, mostly minuscule components that I started with have turned into something reassuringly phone-shaped. Quite satisfying, I'll be honest. I find that many of the troubles of the world disappear 
as I do up a very, very small screw. There you are, you see, for five glorious, blissful minutes while I did that, I'd completely forgotten that my missus left me last night. <laughs> she, she, she hasn't actually, but, uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm always slightly surprised when she's still there. Now this, I think, if I've got this right, these two little, I'm not even sure what I would call those, are they tabs? They will go through those slight cutouts in the Bakelite, and then I will give it a little bit of a turn and that will lock it in place behind that edge and I will put the screw in, the awkward screw from the bottom and that will be the dial in. Yeah, you see that's locked into place but we've got to put that little screw in. Right, I'm expected to get a screw. That's very awkward. The magic screwdriver may not help me here. It's very dark inside the 1950s. Hang on, I need a torch. Ah, there you go. Oh, mistress irony. See, imagine if you'd, if you'd approached Alexander Graham Bell and said, your telephone's brilliant, mate, but I think it needs a torch on it. I mean, people would have said you were mad. I need a method of sort of... Oh, that doesn't work. How long are you going to watch me doing this before somebody says, shall I come and hold that torch for you? I can hold it. Brilliant. So you've got all those shots so I need to see, I need to get the magic screwdriver back in the slot back, so... Um... Do you want me to come and hold the torch? Yeah, yeah, sure. Careful, it's on contact, she might ring something. Well, no part, the three-man job. <laughs> it needs a sort of hole there to... Up a bit with the torch, please. That's it. Ta-da! Yeah, German. Thank you. Right. I think we're in the position. We're very, very close to telephone closure here. We can put the base on and then insert the little slidey out tray that has the numbers for the Prime Minister and so on on it. Let's go and get those bits. Probably don't need that. I think first, actually, we'll put together the little drawer in the bottom that has the handy telephone numbers on it. Because you don't get that with telephones anymore. The, the phone numbers are inside it. If they're anywhere, that's the handle, that's the finishing strip, and those are the two itty-bitty screws. OK. <laughs> Here is the sheet of the handy numbers. Oh, it's a BBC telephone. I hadn't looked at that. Broadcasting House, Kensington House, Riverside Studios, 86764. This was probably still in service last week. Local calls, nine, followed by the number required. Oh, it actually goes in there. OK, so there's two screws, and there's a small handle. It goes on the front, and then that, which I'm imagining, is a finisher, which would go like that. PTO. Now this is exciting. Are you watching this? The little card of all the numbers you'll ever need slides inside that thing like that. And then you can lift it up. That's why the other side is printed the other way up, you see. Look at that.
There's a huge amount of thought gone into this. It's even got those two little spring-loaded things that mean this will slide in and it will make a satisfying boop, and then it won't come out again. You'll pull it, but it will stop. A bit like a kitchen drawer. Right, we're very, very close to the end. Just a moment of reorganisation. Now we're going to get the base, screw it on, insert the drawer, and then the telephone is complete and we can put the receiver on its cradle. Are we ready for this? Do you want to take a few moments to compose yourselves and maybe go to the lavatory and pour another drink? So those are the feet. And then the base itself. And I've just noticed, I don't know why I didn't see this before, but there's a much, much better wiring diagram for the telephone actually on the telephone. It's much clearer. Yeah, it just makes perfect sense. Nipping up. Now we're almost there, but that has to go on. After six hours and 37 minutes, this reassembly is almost finished. The 1957 GPO Bakelite telephone with internal bell will soon be complete. Standby caller. Now, I've got a little bit of telephone trivia for you, if you're interested, about the 999 emergency number, which is written on this little piece of cardboard that goes on the front of the dial. And the reason it's 999 is not, as a lot of people imagine, because in the dark you can put your two fingers in the dial and find the nine. That's a silly theory because you could just as easily find the zero. The reason is the telephone works by sending a series of pulses down the line. That's three pulses for the number three. The problem with it is telephone exchanges would take a while to wake up. They couldn't wake up with just a one. They needed a big number like zero, which is why most telephone numbers began with a zero. And that's one problem. The other problem is that the early telephone lines were suspended through the air, and if they touched each other, that sent a pulse down the line. And on windy days, they would occasionally touch, and you'd get a single pulse down the line. And there was a very good chance that you could get three of those in succession, which would give you one, one, one. And if you'd made one, 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 the emergency dialing number, that would happen by accident all the time. By making it 999, the chances of you getting three bursts of nine collisions of wires are, are you know, just billions and billions to one. So it wouldn't happen accidentally. That is why we have 999 as the emergency number. Here is the small piece of, I imagine that's cellulose acetate or something like that, with its locating pin at the bottom, so you can't put this perfectly blank circular piece of stuff in in the wrong position. It only has a wrong position as a result of having the device to make sure you put it in the right position. The 1957 GPO supplied British domestic Bakelite telephone with an internal bell. The weird thing is that when this was new, this would have been a miracle of technology, um, a marvel of manufacturing because of all those small bits in it. Now it's old, the thing we like about it is the way it looks, not the way it works. Yes, it's part of the history of art and design. It is part of the history of technology as well, but old technology is useless. Old art and design is still interesting. Should we plug it in and see if it works? Somebody get that.